Chapter 4 deals with the tissue level of organization now. There's four main tissue types, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. This diagram is just showing you a little bit of a representation of where you may find some of these uh, different types of tissue and an example of what it looks like um, from a microscopic point of view. Tissue membranes, these are thin layer cells. They cover the organs, they cover the internal passageways, they cover the outside of the body, they cover the lining of your movable joint cavities. There's two main types of membranes. All of them will be classified as one of these two types, either connective tissue membranes or epithelial membranes. And in this picture, it's showing you the different subtypes of them, once again, giving some examples of where they may be found, such as mucous membranes, serous membranes, cutaneous membrane, and synovial membrane. So the connective tissue membrane, this will be covering the organs, and then it also does line your movable joints. So the synovial membrane is an example of a connective tissue membrane. It lines a uh, the joint cavity, a synovial joint, is a movable joint, so it's going to line that, that movable joint cavity. It actually also is involved with uh, secretion of the synovial fluid that helps to lubricate that joint. The three main categories or types of epithelial membranes are your mucous membrane, serous membranes, and cutaneous membrane. Mucous membranes are going to line cavities and passageways that have an opening to your external environment. So there's, there's an opening to the outside. So things like your digestive uh, tract, your respiratory tract, urinary and reproductive tracts, all of those have openings to the outside. So it's going to be mucous membranes. Serous membranes line those cavities that don't have an opening to the external or outside environment. Things like your pleural membranes that are around the lungs, the pericardial that surrounds the heart, the peritoneal cavities. The cutaneous membrane, that's just another name for your skin. Now we're going to look at the four different types of tissues, that nervous, muscle, connective, and epithelial tissue, give some examples of each. Epithelial tissue, covers areas and it's going to have one exposed surface, so one free surface. There's very little or no extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix is material that is outside of the cell. So there's very little or none of this extracellular matrix with epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is avascular, so it's dependent upon underlying tissue to supply the blood and nutrients which supplies oxygen and nutrients that it needs for survival. And that's going to give you a clue also that epithelial tissue tends to be relatively thin or on the surface of farthest away from the underlying tissue, which tends to be connective. So farther away from those blood vessels in the underlying tissue, uh, the cells are going to start dying. Uh, epithelial on that exposed surface tends to slough off dead or damaged cells. Epithelial tissue tends to be able to go through mitosis rather quickly, meaning it's able to reproduce cells, uh, whether they be damaged, injured, die off, etc. They can repair that rather quickly. What's the general function of epithelial tissue? Number one is protection, because it is lining so many of these cavities and exposed surfaces. It's anything to enter the body has to pass through the epithelial tissue first, so it's, it has a protective mechanism to it. It does control permeability, meaning it controls what can move in and out of the cell. And then secretion, it often secretes substances. Maybe it's mucus, maybe it's different other chemicals that are involved with breaking down other stuff. There are certain things that are um, accessory structures, if you will, in the epithelial cell. Not all cells will have these, but some do. One thing that we do see on 
in certain areas on the epithelial tissues on the individual cells will have these little microscopic extensions, the cilia. And the purpose is to move fluid across that free surface. Uh, in the respiratory tract, we see this where it's moving that uh, phlegm that traps particles to keep particles from getting down into your lungs. So epithelial cells tend to have one free surface, and then the surface opposite of that is going to be in contact with underlying tissue, which is usually connective tissue. Epithelial cells tend to have uh, what we call cell-to-cell -cell junctions, a means of connecting the cells together. There's three main types of these, tight junctions, anchoring junctions, and gap junctions. Uh, gap junctions look like little pores, as you can see over here, between adjacent cells. So fluid can flow between them. Tight junctions are holding the cells very tightly together, essentially making it almost like um, a waterproof seal. And then the anchoring junctions, they're often described as being almost like rivets that help to hold adjacent cells tightly together. So how do we classify epithelial tissue? Two main ways. Number one, you're going to look at how many layers of cells are there. If it's one layer, it's called simple. If it's multiple layers, it's called stratified. And then you look at the shape of the cell. If it's rectangular shape, we call it columnar. If it's kind of a square, like a box, it's cuboidal. And then if it's this flattened, squished looking cell, then it's called squamous. So those are the two things that we'll use to classify. And we combine them then together. So you can have a simple squamous, which just be a single layer of these flattened cells. But if it's stratified squamous, then it's going to be multiple layers. Likewise, you can have simple cuboidal, stratified cuboidal. You can have simple columnar, you can have stratified columnar. So whenever you see simple, think one layer, stratified, two layers. And then squamous, cuboidal, and columnar describe the shape of the cell. Now, as with so many things, of course, we're going to have an exception here. We have what's known as pseudostratified columnar cells. So columnar tells you it's going to be rectangular shape. So what does pseudostratified mean? Pseudo means false. So what happens with these cells, it's only one layer, so it would be simple. As you see over here, the nuclei tend to kind of be relatively in the same spot from one cell to another. So it's easy to see it's one layer. On pseudostratified, notice how the nuclei on the cells, they're kind of all over the place. So when you just sort of glance at it, your first thought, if you did a quick glance, is like, oh, that's multi-layered. And sometimes, notice how like this cell right here is very large down on the bottom, but it kind of gets squished out on the top. So it, it definitely looks like it's multi-layered, but in reality, it's only a a single layer, so we call it pseudostratified. In this table, it just gives the uh, different categories of the epithelial, the simple, here's the pseudostratified columnar one, and then the very stratified ones. It gives an example of where you may find them, what part of their function is. Now, transitional epithelial, this is another special case. Um, this lines your bladder, your urinary bladder, and what happens is sometimes when you look at it, it looks multi-layered like it is in this drawing. So when the bladder is empty, it looks multi-layered, and it actually almost on the surface kind of looks cuboidal in shape. However, as the bladder fills and it has to stretch, those cells of the transitional epithelial will tend to flatten out to allow more surface area. That's what's allowing the bladder to stretch and then hold more volume. So it depends on whether you're looking at is the bladder empty, is it full, as to what the cells are actually going to look like. So they trans transition from one shape to another. 
Glandular epithelium, there's two different types of glands. Glands are something that will secrete a substance, some type of chemical. They're made of epithelial tissue. There's two main categories, endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands, they do not have a duct. So the glands by itself, it doesn't have any little tube that's called a duct that attaches to it that would allow the chemical to move through this little passageway, if you will. It's just the gland, it secretes this chemical directly into the surrounding area, directly into the uh, extracellular material, what we call interstitial fluid. From there, usually where does the chemical go? It may react very uh, nearby, in the location nearby. Oftentimes, it's going to go in the fluid, this interstitial fluid, the fluid between the cells, and end up in the blood, and then be transported into the blood to where it needs to go. What are we talking here? What kind of chemicals? We're talking about your hormones. Exocrine glands, these do have a duct attached to them. So the gland secretes the chemical. The chemical is going to move through the duct to another location, either to the surface of the body, like when you sweat, or into, say, a body cavity, like saliva secreting into your mouth, or a mucus secreting into your intestines. So if it has a duct, it's exocrine. If it does not have a duct, then it's an endocrine. Now, connective tissue has several different functions. It helps to support and protect it. As the name implies, it's connecting to other tissues. It helps to uh, transport fluids and nutrients and waste chemical messages. It helps to insulate the body. And it's also a place of storage for energy. What is it composed of? Well, you're going to have cells because tissue is by the definition is composed of similar type cells. So it is going to have cells. Now one thing that's different between connective tissue and the other three types, muscle, nerve, and <coughs> excuse me, epithelial, <coughs> excuse me, is that the extracellular matrix is present here. This is material outside of the cell. It's composed of ground substance, and then protein fibers. That ground substance may be very hard, it may be liquid. It just depends on what specific type of connective tissue you are talking about. And then the protein fibers. So how do you classify connective tissue? You look at the characteristics of that ground substance and you look at the type of fibers that are present in that extracellular matrix as well. So there's three main broad categories of connective tissue. There's connective tissue proper, there's supportive connective tissue, and then fluid connective tissue. And this is uh, a table, this is in your book, that does show uh, these three broad categories. And then underneath you can see the different types associated with it. So connective tissue proper, you're going to have loose connective tissue and dense connective. They are further subdivided into these categories. Supportive connective tissue, you've got cartilage, of which there's these three types. And then you've got bone, of which there's two different types. And then the fluid is going to be these two types, blood and lymph. And we're going to look at all of these briefly. With connective tissue proper, there's different types of cells that are present. You've got fibroblasts. These are the cells that are secreting substances that help to form that ground substance. Adipocytes are going to store lipids. And your mesenchymal cells, these are adult stem cells. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells, meaning they have not specialized in any particular type of cell yet. The types of fibers that can be present in your connective tissue proper are collagen, elastic, and reticular. Collagen fibers are very, very strong. There is some flexibility to it, but they're very, very strong. Elastic fibers are known for, as the name implies, elastic, that it can be stretched, but then it will return to its original shape. And then reticular fibers, 
They tend to be very narrow compared to the collagen and the elastic, and they have a lot of branching. They help to anchor and support um, the tissue. So your loose connective tissue, it allows for uh, substances to diffuse through it fairly easily. The ground substance is not tightly packed. It can act as a shock absorber. It helps bind the tissues together. So the types of loose connective tissue, as you saw in the previous uh, table a few slides ago, there's adipose, areolar, and reticular. Adipose tissue, which is what is shown here, that's fat tissue. So you can see all of this yellow in the schematic drawing, this white space on the actual uh, picture from the slide, that is your uh, fat. And the nucleus often gets pushed off over here towards the edge. Dense connective tissue has a lot of resistance to stretching. There's two main types, regular and irregular. And as the name implies, dense, the, the ground substance, that matrix, is much thicker than you saw in the loose. For regular dense connective tissue, the fibers are usually running parallel. Examples are like ligaments and tendons. So they're very strong. Uh, irregular, the fibers are just randomly in there. And an example would be like the skin. So this is showing in the drawing. Certainly you can see in the uh, pictures of the slides here how for dense, this regular dense, see how thick those fibers are. There's no pattern down here in the irregular. It's just all, as it says, randomly thrown in there. When we look at cartilage, so this is still types of connective tissue. Cartilage is avascular, so that means there's no blood vessels in it, which is one reason why it takes so long for cartilage to heal. It is dependent upon underlying tissue to provide the blood supply to it because it does not have blood vessels running through it. It does have cells, chondrocytes, that are present in there. Now, the chondrocytes tend to be um, contained in these spaces, and we call the space the lacunae. There's three main types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, fiber cartilage, and elastic cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is the most common. It's very strong, it's very flexible. Examples of it would be the cartilage on the end of your nose, cartilage that's found on your ribcage. Fiber cartilage is very, very tough. So it's found in your intervertebral disc. This, this is the cartilage that's between each of your vertebrae. Kind of acts as a shock absorber. Another example would be the menisci in your, say, in your knee joints. So it's very tough. Elastic cartilage uh, has a great amount of elasticity to it, so you can bend it. It helps to support. An example is your ear. And this is showing pictures of the cartilage. So your highland fiber cartilage and elastic cartilage, but notice how the chondrocytes are in these, um, the highlands, see how it looks transparent, those white areas, that is the space, the, the lacunae that the cells are in. Bone is another type of connective tissue, it is the hardest type, it is a very, very hard ground substance within the, the matrix. Its purpose is to provide protection and support. The ground substance is composed of both collagen fibers and uh, it's called hydroxyapatite, which is the type of calcium phosphate. The collagen fiber allows for flexibility and support, and the calcium phosphate adds strength and hardness. A uh, real easy experiment you can do at home if you want to see and notice the properties of this is that all of you have cooked baked chicken at some point, and you know how the bone gets, um, it's hard, but there's no flexibility to it. You, you could break it fairly easily. That is because when you bake, the high temperature destroys the collagen fibers. So all your seam that's left are, is the calcium phosphate, those mineral salts. Now, if you want to see 
what the collagen fibers would be like, you can dissolve the calcium phosphate. So if you want to, next time you're, say, cooking chicken, is take one of the bones. I usually, when I show this, take either a thigh or a leg bone. And with the raw chicken, pull all the meat off. Don't bake the bone. Take that raw bone. Now, usually what I will do is I will put it in a container, like a Tupperware container, something that you can seal. Pour vinegar. Vinegar is actually acetic acid, and it will dissolve the calcium out of the, the bone. And so put enough vinegar so the, the bone is submerged. It's, it's completely covered with the vinegar. And then seal the container because it's going to stink. Um, because you're going to leave it set. I've done this sometimes where I've let it sit for a week. I've actually let it sit for two weeks. That's why you want it covered. Because obviously we're talking raw chicken here. You don't want that out. Um, so pull as much of the meat off. Pull as much of that cartilage and everything off. So it's just the bone. Submerge it in vinegar. And um, after a week or two, take it out. Now usually I take it out and I put it in like a sandwich bag and seal it in that. Especially like if you have kids and your kids want to see it, you'll be able to bend it like a rubber band. And that's why I say put it in a, a plastic sealed bag. That way nobody's going to get the vinegar or potentially any of the bacteria um, on your hands and such. But especially if you have kids, it's kind of a fun little experiment to do because it shows these two properties of the calcium phosphates adding that hardness. So when you bake, you destroy the collagen fibers. You lose the flexibility. When you take a raw bone and you put it in the vinegar, it destroys the calcium phosphate, and all you have left are the, calcium, are the collagen fibers, so it's very flexible. And it really helps to show you how these two properties come together to give bone a lot of hardness, a lot of strength, and a little bit of flexibility. I mean, not that you want your bones bending, but you... You don't want them to break anytime anything hits them. Bone is very highly, highly vascular. It's constantly remodeling the cells, or breaking down, going through division. And so they need to have a very, it's very actively growing cells. So you need a good blood supply too. And the osteocytes, the bone cells, they are also found in lacuna in these, um, they look like little cavities. Still with connective tissue, now we have fluid connective tissue. There's two types, blood and lymph. The extracellular matrix is liquid, that's why it's fluid. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and all of these different types, like the blood and lymph, we'll study when we cover the cardiovascular system and when we cover the lymphatic system. But this is just a picture showing blood where uh, you've got your red blood cells. Those are the erythrocytes. This large purple cell right here, it's called a lymphocyte. It's a type of a white blood cell. And then what you're not seeing, this white here, is the fluid or the plasma. So that's it for the connective tissue. Now we're moving on to muscle tissue. Muscle tissue uh, is able to respond to stimuli. So if it's excited, it responds to it. Uh, it allows for movement. It's contractile. There's three different types of muscle tissue. We have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is under voluntary control, and it's striated. I mean, when you look at it under the microscope, it looks like it has stripes to it. It can have more than one nucleus per cell. It tends to, when you look at it under the microscope, be in uh, very nice parallel lines. There's no branching to it. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, so you cannot control it. It is also striated, meaning it has those stripes when you look at it. Now, when you look at it under the microscope, there will be a lot of branching to it. And each cell only has one nucleus. The skeletal cell may have more than one. Cardiac is found only in the heart. It's your heart muscle. Smooth muscle is under involuntary control, so you can't control it, just like you cannot control cardiac muscle. 
When you look at it under the microscope, it does not have those striations to it. It has just one nucleus per cell. It's kind of spindle shaped. Smooth muscle is found um, with a lot of your abdominal organs. Smooth muscle is going to be found along the digestive tract, um, along part of the, the wall of the blood vessels. So a lot of the internal organs have smooth muscles with them. Looking at it under the microscope, this is just showing the ex examples as you can see labeled your skeletal muscle, which are these nice parallel lines, kind of has these little faint stripings to it. Smooth muscle, no striping. This is the nucleus, these dark colors here. And then cardiac muscle, which has this branching to it, and it does have the striations. If you were to enlarge it, you'd be able to see it better. So for the different muscle types, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, tells you a little bit about what it looks like under the microscope, what its function is, and where you're going to find it. Nervous tissue is the fourth type, so you have epithelial connective muscle. Now we have nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is also able to receive a stimulus and becomes excited. It's able to send and receive electrical impulses. There's two different types of nervous tissue. There's the neuron, which is actually able to generate this electrical impulse, and the neuroglial, sometimes just called glial cells, are your supporting cells. And so on a neuron, the one that can generate the electrical impulse, you have this area here is known as the cell body. That is where the nucleus is and most of the organelles within the cell. You do have these extensions depending on the type of neuron. It will depend on how many extensions you have. The smaller ones are the dendrites. They're receiving the electrical impulse. And then it's going to send the impulse down this longer extension that's your axon towards the end here. And then this end, on the axon terminal end, it will stimulate the cell that's either a muscle or another nerve or a gland. And in here, the histology slide is showing uh, both of these are neurons right here. They have the kind of that characteristic odd shape to them and the very long axons. And then this diagram is showing here once again are some neurons. And then this would be in the either the brain or the spinal cord. You have some of these supporting cells that have different shapes. Uh, some of these are helping to protect the brain, the spinal cord, and any foreign substances. And then some of them, when we cover the nervous system, we'll talk about these. Some of them, like the oligodendrocyte, wrap around the axons and they help to um, provide insulation for that electrical charge to be able to travel down the axon and not be dissipated out to surrounding tissue. So what happens when tissue is injured? It needs to be repaired. Whenever tissue is injured, there are certain chemicals that are sent out and it triggers your inflammatory response. That's going to be one of your first responses to any type of injury. Necrosis refers to cell death. And whenever you have necrosis, uh, some, something has happened, let's say a burn and cells are dying, that's going to trigger the inflammatory response. Apolytosis is programmed cell death. Some cells will have this, there are certain triggers. And this, when it's the specified program cell death, that will not trigger the inflammatory response. And edema is just a, the medical term for swelling. So what are the signs of inflammation? You're going to have redness, swelling, heat, and pain. You may also have loss of function of that area, depending on how severe these other uh, signs are. Inflammation, when you have an injury, you're going to increase the blood flow. It's going to trigger the blood vessels to dilate in that area near the injured site. So you increase blood flow, that's going to cause the redness. That's also going to cause the heat because blood carries heat with it. You have this increased blood flow and increased um, permeability of the 
blood capillaries, blood vessels, where more of the fluid can kind of leak out because you're trying to get the white blood cells that fight foreign invaders. Uh, you want to make sure there's not going to be infection, and it's your body's way of attracting these white blood cells to come attack if there's any foreign invaders. They will also break down any damaged um, cells in the area. Well, that increase of fluid coming in and leaking out is what triggers the swelling. And then the swelling, it's going to be pushing up against some of your nerve endings, and that's what causes the pain. But all of it is it's an inconvenience to us, but it's all a way of your body trying to deal with the injury and repair it. And there are certainly different effects of aging that we see um, on the body. You can see it on the overall body as a, the entire organism. You can see it when you look at the systemic level. You can also see it down if you go look at the cellular level. Most of the functions start to decline with age. It's just a, a fact of aging. The cellular level, like I said, some of this decline works the uh, as well. Things just slow down. They're not as efficient anymore. Oftentimes, when things aren't working quite as much, you slow down. And one problem that you often have have is that if a person is say bedridden, they're not using their muscles and you start to have loss of mass, and that's atrophy. Muscle atrophy is a huge concern with someone who is bedridden. Loss of mass, you're not using it. That organ becomes um, less efficient, and so it doesn't function as well. And you get caught in a kind of a cycle. If something's not functioning 100%, it may hurt, it may make you sore, so then you don't want to do something that makes you hurt, so then you use it even less, and you get caught in this cycle. Now, not everyone sees the effects of aging at the same time or to the same degree. Part of it is genetic, part of it is environmental, part of it is, you know, what was your overall health and level of activity as you age? So studies certainly have shown that, yes, genetics can play a role, but also your lifestyle. If you can remain as active for as long as possible, you know, that, that certainly is to your benefit.